Have you ever felt the echo of missed chances? The silence where the sound of celebration should ring out. That's the sting of lost opportunities due to the inability to truly connect, to resonate with potential clients, to communicate the true value that you bring to the table with passion and precision. And the truth, it's not the lack of service quality that hinders, but the absence of warm, compelling, and persuasive communication. These really are game changers, the secret ingredients to turning maybes into definites. And that's where we come in at Teachable Moments. If you're a lawyer, financial advisor, business consultant, accountant, trustee, director, sales leader, subject matter expert, or anyone else offering professional services, this podcast is tailored just for you. Time after time, opportunities are missed, and businesses and careers stutter because of a lack of simple, teachable communication and negotiation skills. I'm David Solomons. And I'm Matthew Dashby Hughes. Coming up in this episode... We're going to talk a little bit about storytelling today. Now, now, David, when, when you and I first met and we first started talking about doing a podcast, you know, we were, we were sitting on a, a, a panel talking about business development. And one of the things that struck me is that you came across like just a natural raconteur, a natural storyteller. And, and it was only afterwards when I got to know you a little bit better that actually you were telling me, well, this was something that you really believed in. You've spent a long time honing and working deliberately on your ability to, to tell stories and to craft good stories and to tell them in a really compelling way. I've got to ask you, why? What, what, what's so important about <laughs> stories? <laughs> um, oh, God. I mean, this is one of my huge passions in life. The answer is, what's important about stories? Absolutely everything. Um, so I, I love stories when I was a kid. I, I grew up telling stories, you know, hearing. I, I've always done that. And um, then about maybe 10 years ago, I became fascinated. The, the idea of storytelling in business had started to grow. There was a lot written about it, a lot of science about it. And I became fascinated and still fascinated with the way storytelling works on the brain. Um, and I started to listen. Then actually, I gave some workshops on how to tell stories. At that time, it wasn't really about business. I just loved stories, mythical stories, stories about my own life, stories about other people's. And I started to work on them and, and, and start honing them. But it was more for fun than to get good at it, if you like. And then um, I started reading about how it works in business, about how the brain works, about the parts of the brain that, that uh, spark into life when you tell stories that simply do not spark into life when you give someone facts and data. And I just became fascinated by this, particularly about how the brain works. And so I just did more and more of it. I started using stories in business and I realized that I could relate more to people. They they listened, and I and I and, when, and I'd say to them, "Have you got a story? Tell me a story about this." And so I kind of got closer to people. And I mean, stories. I mean, we, we, I'm sure we'll come on to stories. Are I mean, stories they they inspire, they educate, they persuade, and don't forget the end. They sell. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and. And people love stories. And I, I can tell you, I mean, you'll ask me some questions and I'll give you some answers. But I mean, stories have been really important to me forever. But consciously, I would say, over probably the last five to 10 years, because I do a fair bit of public speaking, I always tell stories. I mean, the joke is, you know, for God's sake, let someone stop David telling a story. Because yeah, I always do that. <laughs> Um, but I'm not going to do yeah. it right now. I'm going to answer the questions. But no, you're absolutely right. Fact, fact, there's, there's the old adage, isn't it? It's uh, facts tell, stories sell. And, and it is yeah. it's, it, it, the way we interact with the world is, is by seeing cause and effect. And sometimes we'll build narratives, even where there aren't narratives there. Um, it, it's, it's very much the story that we tell ourselves about the world that we respond our, to. and We, we have no choice. To. We don't have a choice. Our, our, brain, yeah. our brains are storytelling machines. Right. They make them up exactly all the that. time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think so, the, the, the phrase I love is, uh, I forgot, I don't remember who said, he who tells the stories rules the world. Yeah, and, and I mean, so there's there's lots and lots of work around this. I mean, Joseph Campbell is obviously the, the really classic one, the, the hero's journey and all that stuff, Look, looking at, you know, yeah. the, the way yeah. that there's certain mythical archetypes and, and actually all, all civilizations, all human civilizations tell effectively the same kind of uh, transformative journey type stories. So it's, it's, it's kind of how we relate to the human condition. It's how we think about yeah. things. And, and, you know, actually talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, you, you talk about telling stories in business how do you use that kind of um that kind of element of, of you know that that hero's journey if you will within a it's business a, it's, not, it's not it's not always the hero's journey the hero's mm. journey, journey is, is one of the types which i sure. do use a lot but often you want to tell a simple story to a mm -hmm. client and there are many kinds of stories that you can tell and you have to think about 
but I mean, when I tell a story in business, I would tend to say to a client or so, is it okay if I tell you a story? They'll never say no or hardly ever. Okay. And I, I try and encapsulate it in a sim. And, and what I'm looking for is something that sparks them off. And there are mm. different types of stories. So there are origin stories about how the business started, brand stories about the about how uh, how you created the brand, where you created the brand. And you might say, you know, um, I'm glad you asked me that question. I had another client who had exactly the same question. And you just go into it that way. Yeah. And it just, and you see people st- take a breath and relax. But the thing is, Joseph Campbell's great. And I'm a great lover of Joseph Campbell, particularly what Star Wars did it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, true, I, mean yeah. I mean, you know, that was George Lucas was a huge fan and actually lectured with Joseph Campbell. But now we know all these years later why it works. We didn't know that really then, how the brain works. The brain triggers um, all sorts of chemicals. Uh, I mean, if I, if I want to get you excited about a story, I, I start saying things really quickly. And then this happened and dopamine kicks in and your memory is strong. You listen to it, your memory, you recall it and you are motivated. Yeah. And if I want to create a bond with you, which is often with a client. So you want a sympathetic story, a story in which there's suffering and, they, and it might be your suffering to make them feel closer or even the suffering of a brand. I've seen mm-hmm. that done before. Um, that, that, that then oxytocin kicks in in the brain, and that that's like the love drug that bonds, mm-hmm. you know. And there are all sorts of ways that you can do it. Now, this may seem manipulative, but all that's really happening is science is telling you why it's working. Yeah. Okay. And, exactly. and knowing that is helpful, but you're still going to tell the same stories. You know, you've got to kick off with a hook. One of my stories about how I started is starts off with an opening line, which is. Um, I've just been made partner of a small firm in Chelsea and then I committed the worst mistake of my entire life. Well, so you're not going to, you know, whereas if I say to you, uh, I was a, a lawyer for five years then I did this, then I did that. Yeah. You know, right. you, it, it, and it's really because there's an awful lot of, um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of data about how much is retained by the brain in stories and how much is retained in pure data. Mm-hmm. So the winning combination is wrapping the data or the message in a story. It's yeah. the sticky stuff. It sticks to the brain. Exactly. It's it's that it's that narrative. It gives it gives it meaning because you you can't separate the the content from the context. It has to have context to make it meaningful. You have to understand the full ecosystem of what's really going on, and and that means a narrative. It means that you need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It means that you need to have somebody in there that you actually care about. You know, there needs to be a protagonist and there has to be some peril and there has to be some something that actually, you know, there has to be like a little kind of grit in the oyster shell that's going to deliver this pearl. You know, there's got to be something in there, right? I mean, there are lots of uh, examples of it actually working, which I think might yeah. be relevant. Do you know, I don't know if you've heard of the, the significant objects experiments. Go on, yeah, tell this me more. Was a, this was a, tell me more. This was a social experiment that took place in 2009. It was it was carried out by um, two guys, Rob Walker and Josh Glenn, who were both journalists at the New York Times uh, magazine. They'd heard how fantastic stories were. They were in the business of stories. They wanted to see if it actually paid money. So what they did is they went on eBay and they bought 200 objects. And for these 200 objects, they paid $129 total they were rubbish objects like a little uh doorknob or there was i I saw one there was a a pen with a little uh um, horse eraser on the end they were just complete rubbish okay Uh, but they bought them and then these arrived at the new york times they put them in the room and they then called 200 journalists because they were in the business of journalists and they asked each journalist to write a paragraph about the object, make up a story, write a paragraph, give it a narrative. They then did that. They then put all 200 objects back on eBay to see what happened. And you can imagine the excitement in the New York Times. Well, they wait, will it work? Will what happened? Well, let me tell you, they paid 100, I think that's $129 uh, for the whole lot. When it went back on it, it was sold for $8,000. 6,300%. It's absolute three six thousand three hundred percent, and uh, that um, uh, pe- a pencil with the eraser on the end, it was sold for like a hundred and ninety dollars. I keep saying euros. I think you think euros. It was it was incredible, 
And it was only because of the story. And you think, why? Why? And it's because it goes, it's the sticky part of the brain. We read yeah. it and, and we, we buy, we buy. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. the same with selling professional services. Could not agree more. It's, it's and I've got a personal one I'll tell you in a minute. But if you ask yeah. me, I, 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 well, this, Please, I just, so, I, so I, give, us, give us your well, personal one as well then. Fire well, away. well this, is, this is really, this is more a, 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 an example I, I was aware of. Many years ago, I was in New York and I, want, I was going, I was working, I was doing some brand licensing for a company. Uh, and it was actually a British museum and we were going to meet Stetson, you know, the hat company, mm -hmm. the biggest hat company in the world. They also had a licensing division. And I went and I was a, young, a fairly young lad and I was very nervous. And I, I remember it was, it was in on Sixth Avenue, this massive, massive building. And I, they made me wait for hours. And eventually I was meeting the vice president in charge of licensing. And I went in to see this gentleman, big guy. You know, and he naturally, he was wearing a Stetson which was even more scary, big Stetson. He looked like John Wayne or Clint Eastwood and a bit fatter, I have to say. Um, and we were chatting and uh, and on, just off to the side of him, there was a Stetson hat and he, I couldn't help looking at it. It just looked familiar to me. And and we, we did some business and, uh, uh, and we carried on talking and he just saw me looking like going like this. And he said, are you interested in the hat? I think he actually said, are you interested in the hat? And I said, well, I am. It looks familiar. And he told me that that was the original hat, Stetson hat, that was used in the Indiana Jack Jones film, the very first one. Right. And he told me, and I still don't know whether it's true or not. He told me that it was the first product placement of its type. And he paid, um, it would have been George Lucas, I guess, or, or Spielberg. Mm -hmm. He paid them. A uh, million dollars to place that in there. He actually paid, and that was the first we saw. But for me, the most fascinating thing was this hat was sold um, in retail. It was well over a hundred dollars at the time, which, which was a lot of money for a hat. This wasn't a hat for a child. Hmm. This was a hat for a man. This became their biggest selling hat of all time, bar hmm. nothing. A company that you know existed since the days of the West. And I always kept asking myself, what is it? What man went into a shop and said, I'm going to be like Indiana Jones? What man actually did? It couldn't have been consciously. <laughs> it's like what man goes into a James Bond film and says, I'm going to be a little bit more like James Bond when he walks out. It's not logical. It just goes to that sticky part. And they sold hundreds of thousands of these hats to fully grown men who went to work, who, who had families, who went to offices. And yet in their heads somewhere, somewhere, they were Indiana Jones. And yeah. that's how it works. There you go. We all want to be a little bit more Harrison Ford at some level. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I certainly do. Oh, this Absolutely. Is, we, you, you and I are both uh, living that same delusion. We're, we're men of a certain <laughs> age. What can I say? <laughs> oh, dear. We are what uh, we yeah. are. Yeah, we are what we are. It's, it's oh, really yeah. interesting, though. I mean, I, I think stories can be so powerful for so many reasons, and I think um, what, one of the one of the things that I've done so much of over the years is, is recruitment. You know, I've recruited a lot of people. I've, I've, I've coached people through getting new roles and getting new jobs. Uh, and, you know, teaching them how to tell a story as part of their answers in, a, in an interview is probably one of the best things that you can teach somebody to do. So if you want to show one of your skills, tell them a story about that skill. So you kind of give yeah. them like a little bit of a structure. And this is, this is a well, this is a time worn way of doing it, but you can teach yeah. people how to, how to work a, a story structure. There's like a, an acronym, which is very well kind of, uh, uh, no, which is star S D A R. Um, uh, I don't know if you've come across this it's very simple situation, task, action, result. And, and so yeah. if you think about it, here's the context, here's what was going on. So it's the setup, if you will, you know, it's, it's yeah. the, um, years ago I was going into a, in, into Stetson, you know, there's your set, setup straight yeah. The, t the task is, Oh, uh, the task is, is I, I, I needed to kind of sell something, but, uh, and here's the action. I, I noticed this hat uh, and it's, and it would look really familiar. And, yeah. and then the result is the payoff, right? So you can, you can break down almost all stories into that kind of form. And, and if, you te if you teach somebody how to do that, they can actually tell a really punchy, quite effective story in the course of, you know, less than two minutes. And you can get across the point in such a way that, as you say, it's sticky. It lands in the other person's brain. I think the important thing is there has to be obviously a character in there, characters, yeah. plots, 
and conflict. There has to be, yes. and and the, you know the reason the reason why it has to be some conflict is the brain only notices movement. It doesn't notice yeah. if you if, if someone tells us tells a I wouldn't call it a story, but a a, a a monologue in which I did this and I did this and I did this and I the brain's not noticing it. Yeah. There has to be change in there for the brain to notice it for you to wake up, and yes. that is where the dopamine kicks in, and it's where you. You remember it. And I remember, this is why we remember stories from when we were children. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the only facts I knew, I remember uh, from being a kid, are ones that were wrapped up in stories. I remember it said in the Bible that the world was created in seven days because it was an interesting story. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, stories like Bible stories like when I was a kid, they were always the stories. You remember the fact that, you know, uh, 1066, William the Conqueror and all that stuff. But yeah. why do you remember it? Because the king died the with eye. an arrow in his eye. Exactly, Absolutely. the eye. There you go, straight it, away. <laughs> exactly. It, well, you know, um, people who use, um, who are memory experts, mm. um, they, they use uh, something called memory palaces. Do you know what memory palaces are? You Indeed. do, yeah. Well, for those who on here who don't know, memory palaces is, is an idea of you can you can list thousands and thousands of names of, of of objects or anything you want, and you create a palace or a house in which they're and you place them in your mind in a certain way. This was developed by the Chinese and by the ancient Greek, and some people memory memory geniuses can do hundreds of thousands. I can't do that. But I can do some of it. And in order to test it, um, I uh, once gave a speech in which I learnt the names of all of every, every name of every Shakespeare speech. I think there were 42 or 43. And I learnt them in order. And the way I did it is I was then living in an apartment in, in uh, North London. And I put them on different parts of the wall as I walked round the, the mm -hmm. names. And, I, and I, you create caricatures of them. So, yeah. um, you know, love's labor lost. You'd have a girl lying there crying, you know, with, with an arrow through her heart in a, in a cartoon. And you'd remember, yeah. and it sticks like that. And what, and, and, I, and I, funny enough, when I gave a speech, I got the first one wrong. Uh, I asked someone to name it and I thought, oh God, I've got to carry on anyway. And I carried on. And they were all right after that. But what that, did, what that does is demonstrate that a good story, a good idea, will stick in your mind. And, and, and it did for all the Shakespeare speeches. And really good people could do thousands of them. Mm, yeah. It's just more, it, more proof if you need it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. And it's a way that you can access so much going on in your own brain. And, you know, you tell yourself stories and, and, and you can remember things in that story form. So it's, it's an absolutely. aid to memory. It's an aid to helping to aid to understanding. It's a, it's a way to help sell things. It's also, and this, this is something which is possibly something we don't talk about very often in business, but it's a very powerful tool. You can use story to actually help to help somebody to to see something that's maybe something they don't want to hear so you can actually tell people yeah. bad news in the form of a story we used to have like a rule which is uh, when, when you've got to tell somebody something bad use a third party story so you you kind of paint a picture of somebody who is very similar to the person you're talking to and you tell the story of how this other person might have self-sabotaged by doing something that isn't really in their own best interest. And, and actually utilizing a story in that way, it kind of it allows it allows you to take them on that kind of emotional journey of, ooh, there but for the grace of God go I. And yeah. and they recognize that maybe they're also in the same space of making the, the same mistakes. And, and, and it sort of takes some of the emotional heat out of it whilst at the same time allowing them to really truly realize that they're making the same errors. And, and it can be quite a powerful tool to use stories in, in that way as well. So again, like you said earlier, it might feel like it's being manipulative. It's really not. It's actually just helping people to see the world as it really is. I think what's useful to look at, and I actually made a list here of the reasons why people don't tell stories. Yeah. In meetings. That's interesting. Okay. And, and, I mean, and I, I mean, and it, it looks like this. This is the thoughts going through. They don't have time to listen to my story. They just want the facts. Hmm. Stories are childish and silly. Oh, I'm not a storyteller. I don't know. I'm just a whatever. Hmm. I don't like talking about myself. They'll think I'm stupid and I won't get the business anyway. It's fear. Yeah. It, cause, because it takes an element of courage. I mean, it, you know, and I'm pretty experienced. Even at times like, when I want to tell, it might fall flat. It might yeah. not get the point over. Um, but it's such a powerful tool 
that when you talk about business development and you talk about all the things that people do in networking and telling a story is, is, is so natural to human beings. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a funny thing. People say, I haven't got any stories. I don't know any stories. Stories occur every minute of your life. Every, I, run a, a, I run a storytelling group in my village where I get all the people together in, in our group and once a month. And it's called storytelling. And they, they're required to sit on a chair and tell a story. And uh, the times I get caught, oh, I haven't got anything, David. I haven't got anything. And when they sit down, something will occur. And because every single day things happen. And it's just learning to make stories out of them. It's so powerful. I, I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because communication is the most important thing. And if someone said to you, the best way to communicate, to get your point over, to to um, excite someone, to inspire, to persuade is to do that. Mm. Why wouldn't you do it? There, there's a, a rule that I learned many years ago that the person who owns the frame uh, wins the negotiation. So if, if, if you take it back to the sales yeah. kind of environment, that basically you create the frame, you create the reality, you create the perception of what's actually going on. And the only way to do that is to tell a story. The only way, look, you can, you can get inside somebody's head and, and help them with their thoughts for two, in two ways. Number one, you can ask them a question, which prompts them to think. And number two, you can tell them a story, which prompts them to feel. And, and, and between like those two that, things, yes. you know, given the fact that you need to win hearts and minds in that order, you need to prompt them to feel before you prompt them to think. Those two things go together beautifully. I, I remember years ago when I was learning how to do presentations, you know, learning business presentation skills, I, I, I was lucky enough to have a mentor who was really, really good. And, and this goes past the early days when I was actually getting over myself and actually, you know, getting out my own way just from the nerves because getting up on stage was nervy, you know, yeah. get, public speaking, uh, yeah. bloody scary. It is. You know? uh, and, you know, it still is, except these days I treat it as exciting, but that's, 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 yeah. that's another story. Yeah. Um, on, on, on this, I had this lovely mentor and he said, look, the three best ways that you could ever start a, a, a presentation, I'm going to give you them in order. The first one is to give them a fact that, that, that surprises them. And that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's not a bad opener. The second thing is to ask them a question that makes them think. That's, that's really good. That's, that's solid. But the number one way to start a presentation, once upon a time. Now, yeah. you don't literally say that in a business presentation, but you base, but you basically get them into that same space. You know, you, you just get up on stage and you just give them that little moment of pause, like that reflective moment, which allows, allows you to kind of feel mastery of the, of, of the room and they're all waiting for something. And just after that beat pause, you say, so it was a Thursday. It was a Thursday 25 years ago and I'll never forget it. And and they're hooked instantly because they're there. They they know that you're telling them a story. The message is there. They're settled down. They've got their nighttime cocoa and they're ready. They want to hear it. And there are lots of techniques and there there isn't enough how to tell a story. And that's, I mean, I I agree with you, you know, uh, uh, start with a story, do an amazing fact, do something outrageous. Um, Was I think it was, I think it was um, the Microsoft guy. uh, Someone was giving a speech about, about, um, insects that killed or something and he brought a box on stage and he opened the box and all these insects flew towards the audience mm-hmm. they were of course in time i think it might have been bill gates wow. um they were entirely harmless but what an impact for a kickoff right <laughs> everyone, was, ah, everyone listened to every word after that but i think it's yeah i mean start with a, a boom whatever that is but the story is absolutely you know yeah. and a great way of telling stories is tell a past story like you're in the present you know, like you're like here, you know, it's 1975. I'm sitting in a dark room. I had no idea of what was going to happen next. No one did. Boom. Nice. Yeah, you know, it's just kind of, it's in. almost like you're there, you're there with you. Um, yes. But now it's quite, it's quite hard in business to do that. I mean, that's a great, if you're on a, if you've got the stage, that's easy. If you're in a meeting, if you're in a meeting, it's sometimes it's not even about telling a full story. It's about, Using the language, don't use legal language or financial. Use the language of the the, the client or the customer. Mm-hmm. Use their language. I think I, I might have told you. I think I may have told this story in a previous episode where we had clients who were restaurateurs. They came in, and uh, and someone in my team started talking to them about the the law and and going through pages and pages and pages, and they looked so bored. And then someone else walked in and said, "So tell me about this restaurant." 
Um, yeah. What you, what's your favourite meal? What are you going to cook next? What, what's the menu going to? What's the cut? And they were totally. They were. We were in their world. You know, yeah. but it's 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 so it's so true though, isn't it? Use, using language, using the stories that actually people tell themselves in order to help to bridge the gap between where you are and where they are. Bridge the gap between where yeah. they are now and where they need to be. But maybe they don't even see where that is just yet. So I, I, I always yeah. love the fact that um, you know, and you'll have to forgive me here because this is this is where I, I might be terribly offensive to, uh, to 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 some people in our audience and i hope not i really hope not i really hope not but i always think <laughs> if, if you want to solve a problem you need to think like an engineer if you want to sell the solution you need to think like a marketeer like a storyteller and if you want to win an argument you need to think like a lawyer that's that's my that's the way i always think so so yeah, you know yeah. if, if you've got an if you've got an engineer let's take james watt so you know Steam engine, pretty important. Yeah, yeah, Heralded yeah, yeah. in, Her- heralded so in I knew the, that. Uh, the, yeah, there you go, there you go. So, so, so most Im- probably, probably his most important invention, right? Maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. Certainly his most important engineering invention. But for me, his most important invention was actually a marketing invention, and it's the word horsepower, because that's a story. The word horsepower yeah. is a story, and it's a metaphor. What it does, it basically says, "Hey." you people who are sort of doing all this heavy industrial stuff out in the fields, guess what? You've got 25 horses to do all of that. I've got one steam engine with 25 horsepower. Yeah. You don't need 25 horses. You've got one engine. There you Absolutely. Go. So, so straight, just that one word, that's the marketing solution to the, to the engineering solutions adoption problem. And, yeah. and that's, that's a story. You know, ultimately, it's Absolutely. just such a powerful way of changing the way that people think. I, I think it's just incredible. You, you, you watch the um, great Super Bowl adverts, their stories. You watch the John Lewis adverts at Christmas. Right. We live in that world. We, 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 it, what amazes me, we are totally immersed in that world. And yet when a professional has to tell a story during a meeting, it's something so alien to him, even though... He's hearing stories all, or he or she hearing stories all the time. Yeah. It's a strange thing. Isn't it just? Isn't it just? And, and, and I think you're right. You, point, you, you put your finger on it earlier on. There's an element of fear. There's an element oh, of yeah. we, we've kind of built this idea, this shell, this armor, this persona of being incredibly professional. And therefore, we deal in facts. We deal in figures. We deal in the world of absolutes. Whereas stories are those sort of fluffy things that creative people say aren't they, tell, aren't they? Yeah. We're all creative. Human beings are wired yeah. for creativity. We're wired for story. We're wired for narrative. And we are, as you said earlier on, story-making machines. And we are narrative machines. We'll see stories even where there aren't any. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it's a powerful, powerful tool if it's used right. David, I can't believe it, but we, we are we are coming right to the end of our time here. If you had to well, summarize... We always say that. I know, every time, every time. But it's, we oh can talk for gosh. hours about this stuff, as always. Yeah. So, so tell me, if you had to sort of pick out two or three big takeaways from what we've just been talking about, um, you know, actionable, teachable moments, what would you say they are? Well, first of all, you're going to have fear, but you've just got to step through it. Go and practice. Go and practice in the mirror. Then go and practice to a friend. Practice three or four stories, okay? Um, secondly, stay simple, simple, stupid. Okay. Start with a simple plot, start with a, um, a, uh, uh, an argument or a conflict in there and start with a result. And as you say, often in business, it's more a task than a, than a conflict. How do we get the business to this stage? Okay. Without doing that, we haven't got any money. We haven't got, what could we do? OK, it's really as simple as that. Start really, really simple. Um, and always remember, the most important thing is remember, they're going to remember your story. They're not going to remember the facts and the data. Don't tell them what a brilliant accountant you are, what a brilliant lawyer you are. Show them. Tell them a story. They'll walk away with a smile on their face. Fantastic. I think that's the best advice that anybody could possibly give. Um, David, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for your insights. That was wonderful. Thank you. We want to hear from you too. So hit the like button and leave us a review and please share with your friends and colleagues. Make sure you take action and warm those pitches up. And don't forget to be here next time. We have more tips and tools that you won't want to miss. So subscribe now and stay informed. And we'll see you next time.